I'll be talking about the management of complex and systemic urinary tract infections, and this is really uh, taking us into uh, an area where the antibiotics alone may not be enough, and we may have to consider some urological procedures to try and help our patients. Um, we've sort of looked at some definitions before. I mean, Basque has covered this very well in terms of what is a complex UTI, uh, or complicated UTI, I should say. Uh, in terms of systemic, this term is banded around quite a bit, and you've got to make a bit of a distinction between systemic symptoms. So I, this would be what the patient might tell you, that they've got some fevers, rigors, they may have an altered mental status. So these would be systemic symptoms, which can happen with any infection. Now, when we think about in the medical term about a systemic infection, we're really thinking more about a bloodstream borne infection or a bacteremia. So if we think about the title of the talk, complex systemic infections are really be focusing on those infections which are associated with sepsis and the requirement for potential urological intervention. So Basco already showed this chart before, and essentially I'll be really focusing on the pyelonephritis and urosepsis end of this um, spectrum. So we're going to be looking sort of from the top down at kidney infections, so renal abscesses, uh, uh, emphysematous pyelonephritis, xanthogalmatous pyelonephritis. We're going to look at emphysematous cystitis and also prostatic abscesses and hopefully give you a little uh, view of some treatment algorithms that you can keep in your head when you see these patients and touch on some of the guideline recommendations for managing a urosepsis. Um, just to kick off, uh, following on from what Chunde was saying, um, sepsis management, the initial management is crucial. Uh, whether you're in a tertiary center or in a small unit, the first person who sees the patient has got a big responsibility to get the treatment right, because that sets us on the right path for adequately treating that patient. And you don't want to be losing these early hours. Uh, so there is this concept of this golden hour in trauma. And we should probably translate that to a golden hour for sepsis as well. So what I mean by that is aggressive resuscitation. You need to make sure the patient's got their fluids, that cultures have been sent at the early stage, because that will guide your future management when these cultures are back in 24 to 48 hours. You need to be able to have a measure of the urine output. And for a lot of these patients, catheterizing them at an early stage is a good thing because it helps you to accurately monitor that urine output, guide your fluid resuscitation, and also drains the pure urine from the urinary tract as well. Antibiotics are very important at this stage. And then after all this comes, you're planning imaging and your definitive treatments. So before you think about all the urological interventions that you might do, such as putting drains or, or taking the kidney out, all these other things are very important. So don't forget that. If you're taking referrals from as a tertiary unit and these patients are presented somewhere else, it is important for you to check with the team that these basic things have been done because these, as time goes on, it's very difficult to turn the clock back with these simple measures. Um, so moving on um, to renal abscess and uh, sort of perinephric abscesses. Essentially, these are localized collection of pus in the renal cortex and the perinephric tissues. Uh, there was this good systematic review. Uh, it's about uh, 10 years old now, but essentially they looked at uh, 107 uh, studies over a period of 30 years, and about 75% of all these infections are ascending infections, i.e. they start in the bladder and then go up and affect the kidneys. And in about a quarter of the cases, they're hematogenous, i.e. bloodborne spread. Most of the infections that come from the bladder and arise up are unsurprisingly gram-negative, whereas the bloodborne ones are usually staph aureus. Um, interestingly, the mortality has reduced over the past three decades, and that's very much been driven by advances in imaging with earlier diagnosis. So mortality has gone for about, from about 50% uh, down to 1.5 to 15%, depending on the papers you look at. Really, in terms of uh, the therapeutic options, uh, you really got your antimicrobials, percutaneous drainage, open drainage, and nephrectomy. And we'll think a little bit more about these in the coming slide. These are some pictures of what renal abscesses might look like. Um, so you've got, uh, if you look here, you've got kind of a walled off collection in the kidney with a hyperattenuating area. Um, here, you've got some involvement of the cortex and also a little bit of the perinephric tissue. In this slide, uh, in this picture, much more of a multi-loculated type collection compared to the picture above. And this is an ultrasound uh, showing a hypoechoic uh, focus um, in the upper part of the left kidney with some perinephric uh, tracking. So these are what the imaging appearances you could see. 
Uh, which antibiotic should you use? Well, as uh, Chen was saying, I think you should really start with broad spectrum. And I can't really tell you what antibiotic you should use because that would be changing depending on the region of the world you are in and what your local resistance patterns are. But generally, you would start with something broad spectrum, something like amoxicillin and gentamicin. And then after that, once the cultural results get back, you would adjust that. So the message is you start with a broad spectrum with a view to narrowing down in 48, 72 hours one, you have a little bit more specific um, information from a microbiologist. We said that uh, antibiotics may not on their own be enough. So when is the cutoff? So when you decide to intervene, and we're really talking about a percutaneous drain here, generally the cutoff is about five centimeters. So abscesses that are over five centimeters, the success rate with antibiotics alone are not very high. So you do need to think about draining these collections. And from all the studies, if you do drain them with a combination of the antibiotics, then the success rates for re resolution are above 90%. Uh, interestingly, over the past few years, as the, the techniques for interventional radiology have got a lot better, um, the trends in treatment have increased more and more towards a percutaneous drainage approach to these uh, abscesses rather than open drainage, which is traditionally performed. You've got to be careful, however, if you remember the photo uh, I showed you with the multi-loculated abscess, they may not respond very well to drainage because you may only be able to drain one pocket. Uh, for these cases, um, you may not be able to manage them very effectively. So there's a higher risk of requiring a repeat drainage procedure or requiring an open surgical drainage. So this is sort of the, the algorithm that you could uh, keep in your head uh, when you see these patients. So you would um, initially assess them, resuscitate the patient. You'd go with the broad spectrum antibiotic. You would image the patient and make an assessment based on, on the size and the multi-locality. And if it's a large abscess, so above five centimeters, um, you would add in a percutaneous drain together with the antibiotic treatment. If this fails, you would then move on um, to surgery. And in the future, always remember if things improve in a few months time, you'll probably have to follow things up and always think about the structure and function of the urinary tract as uh, my colleague, Mr. Harding often says. So for follow-up scans, often in some form of imaging an ultrasound or a CT and a DMSA scan in a few weeks will pretty much tell you whether there's any residual function left in that kidney if you're thinking about uh, doing a delayed nephrectomy in the future if required. Moving on to emphysematous pyelonephritis. So this is really a necrotizing infection of the renal parenchyma, and this results in gas in the parenchyma and collecting system. It's almost exclusively seen in diabetics. Uh, we generally showed us a nice uh, photo of a patient it treated recently, and E. coli is the most common pathogen. There is a classification system based on CT, which was published about 20 years ago. And this study was only based on 48 patients because of the uh, uncommon nature of the condition, but they did do a very good job at correlating the clinical findings with the outcomes. And essentially you can classify it between one to four, one being gas in the collecting system only, moving on to parenchymal gas only, uh, involvement of the perinephric and pararenal space and grade four is if you got it in a, a sort of a bilateral setting. And this would suggest that as you go up in the grade, um, you may need more treatment and the chances of successful cure simply with antibiotics or simple measures may not be enough. Um, so these are sort of the pictures you might get from an em emphysematous pyelonephritis. The one up here, you can see gas uh, sort of in the parenchyma on both sides, gas in the collecting system here. This is probably a grade four according to the CT classification. If you look at the one here, you've got some gas in the um, perinephric and pyrenal space. So this is probably a 3B on that classification. Uh, similarly for this one, this one's got gas just in the parenchyma. So this might just be a, a one based on your uh, classification. So how would you go about assessing these, uh, these patients? Well, for most of them, you would uh, start off with uh, antibiotics plus minus a consideration of some form of percutaneous drainage. So initially, you would um, assess them, resuscitate them. As we said before, you would get a scan and try and classify them based on the scan findings. The literature would suggest that if you've got a, a class one and two emphysematous uh, pyelonephritis, that they generally respond very well to a combination of, um, so MM here stands for medical management with antibiotics and PCD stands for percutaneous drain. So class one and two tend to respond very well to the combination of the antibiotics plus minus drain. Whereas, um, I mean, class three and 
before the chances of needing further interventions uh, increased quite a bit. And in that uh, paper, they also looked at some specific risk factors that would put you at a higher risk of needing a nephrectomy. These would be things like diabetes and low platelet count, a presentation with acute kidney injury, presentation with shock or an altered mental status. So you've got two or more of these risk factors in a patient with emphysematous um, polynephritis, there's a high chance that um, they may need uh, a nephrectomy. Um, other than uh, when we talked about a lot of percutaneous drain, but uh, you could also consider the placement of a ureteric stent. And there are a few reports of pat uh, patients having ureteric stents put in rather than a percutaneous drain. This may be useful perhaps for patients who may be using anticoagulant and you may not necessarily be able to place uh, a drain, a percutaneous drain straight away, but you may perhaps be able to put a stent uh, un under a short general anesthetic or local anesthetic for that matter. So bear that in mind as a possibility. So in terms of the overall outcomes, so if you look at all patients uh, coming with uh, emphysematous polynephritis, antibiotics alone, you have a high mortality of 40%. Uh, if you use a combination of the antibiotics and the percutaneous drain, about two thirds of them will respond. If you look at the class one and two, most of them do well with the combination of antibiotics and drainage. And the higher classes, we've already said, there's a higher risk of treatment failure uh, and uh, requirement for progression to nephrectomy. Next interesting condition is xanthogranulomatous polynephritis. So this is a rare, a chronic granulomatous inflammatory process, most commonly seen in a diffuse fashion. Uh, Protists and E. coli tend to be the commonest organisms. Um, they're very commonly associated with stones and obstruction in over three quarters of cases. Um, the imaging findings can often mimic a renal cell carcinoma. So a biopsy can often be helpful in terms of telling you what's going on there. The majority of these cases require nephrectomy. Um, these are the appearances of what you might get on a CT. So here you can see the, the distension of the collecting system. You've got a stone here. This has, uh, if you look at these appearances, you might um, think that it resembles a bear paw uh, in the snow. So it's often been called a bear paw sign on the CT. And this would be a pathological sign that, uh, sorry, a radiological sign that you're dealing with uh, XPN. Um, well, we already said that the mass majority of them would require nephrectomy. What's the optimal technique? Do you open? Do you go minimally invasive? So that's been looked at before. And uh, the bottom line is for most of these studies, the major complication rate, regardless of what technique you use, is quite high, between 33 uh, to 40%. Uh, this is a more recent uh, study looking at laparoscopic, robotic, and open uh, procedures. There didn't appear to be any difference in overall complications, but you can see, again, a high clavian 3 and 4. This is a major complication rate of uh, nearly a quarter. The interesting um, one figure on the bottom maps the number of cases done over time with what technique, and the little stars um, really offer open surgery and the dots of a minimal invasive approach. And over time, as surgeons have gotten more confident with the technique, they, they have offered minimal invasive treatment. But the message is offer what is safe in your hands or your institution, just because everybody else is doing through a minimal invasive approach doesn't mean you have to offer that. So just make sure you offer what's safe in your hands. Moving on to emphysematous cystitis. Um, this is pretty a very clinical um, spectrum from incidental diagnosis to fulminant sepsis, often seen in diabetics, neuropaths, and patients who've got bladder outlet obstruction. Um, the appearances on the scan, you can see a little rim of air all around this, uh, the bladder wall and some air in the bladder as well. And uh, unsurprisingly, E. coli seems to be the most common organisms. That's the running theme in all these cases. The key cornerstone of treatment is bladder drainage with a catheter and broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, you need to keep a good index of suspicion for these cases. If they are reported upon scans, uh, intervene quickly because delayed intervention can lead to bladder rupture. You can get an ascending infection causing emphysematous pyelonephritis. Patients can proceed to shock and have a mortality. Although the overall mortality from this is only about 69% because a lot of the cases tend to be subclinical. About 10% need surgical intervention. These would be for cases of bladder rupture. Uh, occasionally, uh, partial cystectomy may have been required for debridement of a devitalized bladder wall. Um, prostatic abscess, this is the last uh, condition. Um, so this is a localized collection of uh, pus or purine fluid within the prostate. It's usually a complication of prostatitis um, seen in diabetics and immunocompromised patients. 
there has been a bit of a shift in the organisms we've seen over time. So before it was mostly associated with sexually transmitted infections, whereas now it's mainly a gram-negative, um, gram-negative organisms drive this process. Mortality is between 1% to 16%. The 16% figure is much older studies. I think these days the mortality is closer to the 1%. Um, the diagnosis is often delayed and high index of suspicion is required. Most of them often get picked up, usually if someone's had a prostatitis diagnosis and not got better or sometimes uh, been treated for a UTI for a long time and then had a CT, for example, with then showed an abscess. These are the sort of the imaging findings you might find. There's an ultrasound showing abscess in the prostate. This is a CT scan. It's a prostate with hyper uh, attenuating area there, suggestive of an abscess. The management uh, antibiotics initially. Uh, cutoff size about a centimeter is used here. So if you have an abscess of one centimeter, by and large, antibiotics alone would be enough. As the abscess gets above one, there's a high chance of requiring intervention with either a transrectal aspiration. Uh, transperineal aspiration or transvaginal resection. Open drainage is very rarely required these days. And this is another little useful algorithm that uh, you may use based on the one centimeter cutoff. So as we said, if it's under a centimeter, your conservative treatment would be enough. If your abscess is over a centimeter, you would try an ultrasound guided transrectal transperineal drain. If things didn't get better, you'd need to have a little look further and see, do we need a transrectal uh, resection type drainage when open drainage and this is quite eloquently uh, discussed in this paper published about three years ago where what they they note that if you've got kind of very mild diffuse appearances that your conservative management would be okay a focal thing like this would respond very well to a transrethral drainage and if you've got a multifocal abscess like this you're probably better off doing a trans uh, rectal or uh, so a tur type drainage and this is what you might see. So the top, if you look at the top panel of pictures, this is um, a picture of us in the prostate. You look uh, resecting the right side of the prostate. You can see the abscess cavity here. And as you resect it, you often get this load of sure pus coming out. And at the end, you sort of get this open uh, cavity. You put a catheter in and hopefully the patient improves um, thereafter. This is what a transrectal a drainage might look like. So this is the, the ultrasound picture there with the abscess cavity in the transverse view. You put a needle through, not dissimilar to doing a truss biopsy. The abscess is aspirated and that's a follow-up ultrasound showing good resolution. So just to finish off in terms of what would the guideline recommendations say, I mean, we, we talked about sepsis already and I think the guidelines are very strong in the EAU about all these initial supportive measures that we discussed in terms of adequately resuscitating the patient, starting your antibiotic therapy, starting off with your high or broad spectrum antibiotics initially and taking the culture. So there are strong recommendations to get these interventions earlier on. Uh, they also give some uh, recommendations requiring antibiotics, and I think a word of caution, whilst these are there, it's important to remember that you might tailor that to your local setting. Um, there is a useful table give, uh, listing the different antibiotics that have been in all the Eurosepsis trials, but the message again is use what you have available locally and liaising with your microbiologist. So to finish off, uh, in summary, a prop management of suspected sepsis is vital with resuscitation, antibiotics, while you plan the definitive procedure. Reassess clinically and repeat the imaging if the patient's not progressing on treatment because you may be evolving into an abscess or a more complex infection. And keep in mind the treatment algorithms that we discussed for the different uh, complex uh, urine infections. Thank you.